Hi, welcome. Uh, I'm Andrea Mafitano, and I'm the Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine. It's my distinct honor to welcome you tonight to this 24th annual Dr. William G. Anderson Lecture Series, Slavery to Freedom and American Odyssey. Um, I'd like to begin by extending our gratitude to the numerous sponsors who have helped make this year's series possible again. Um, many of them have been cycling on the uh, screen behind me. Uh, from the many MSU college and unit sponsors to the community organizations and corporate sponsors, this is truly a collaborative event. I'd ask you to please see the brochures and web pages um, for the complete list of our sponsors this year. And we hope that you'll make it a point to acknowledge them for helping us bring our thought-provoking speakers to East Lansing uh, tonight and over the next several weeks. The dialogues that occur as a part of this series foster important historical and cultural reflections about the contributions of African Americans in this country. As an example, Dr. William G. Anderson, his wife Norma, Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, were each integral in the Albany Movement, one of the most important civil rights struggles in the United States. As many of you know, Dr. William G. Anderson is one of our esteemed faculty and established this lecture series, which was named in his honor in 2014. We're indebted to Dr. Anderson for his sacrifices during the civil rights movement and as a trailblazer in the osteopathic medical profession and for his efforts and passion to make slavery to freedom the distinguished lecture series it has become. I believe Dr. Anderson is in the audience. If he could wave his hand and we can all acknowledge him. Where is he? There? Yeah, yeah, we see you there, great. Relax, sit, sit. <laughs> you've done enough. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to see you. Uh, uh, following along in that legacy, I also want to highlight our Associate Dean for Diversity and Campus Inclusion, Dr. Marita Gilbert. Dr. Gilbert and her team are working tirelessly to assist not only the MSU College of Osteopathic Medicine, but the greater university in becoming places of inclusive excellence. And we thank her for those ongoing efforts, and I'd like to bring her out on the stage right now. Dr. Gilbert, please take over. <laughs> Hello, good evening. And I see we had a meeting about this last year. Okay, this is week one, so we're gonna practice for next week. Okay, so hello, good evening. Good evening. That's better, thank you. Um, welcome again to our Slavery to Freedom lecture series. Um, before we get started, we're gonna do a couple housekeeping things. We're gonna begin with the reading of the land acknowledgement, and that will be read by Dr. Red Dog Sina, who is Associate Professor in, of Health Programs in the Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine Program, and he'll be followed by Phoenix Miranda, who is going to sing Lift Every Voice and Sing. And Phoenix is one of our music performance students in the College of Music. So those are the next voices you'll hear. Mine's the less pretty one. <laughs> Ani. I think, didn't she just talk about this? <laughs> Ani. Ani. That means welcome. We collectively acknowledge that Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples. In particular, the university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. We recognize, support, and, and advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian nations, for historic indigenous communities in Michigan, for indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. And I would add, and were forced into schools where they ex experienced unbelievable horrors in the name of civilization. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty 
and will work to hold Michigan State University more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. This is no fight, this is a fight that is no different from all of the other civil rights battles. A rising tide raises all ships. Thank you. Lift every voice and sing till earth in heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the So working on this program, I, um, I get to work with a lot of people that I love and respect. Um, I want to thank my friend, Dr. Red Dog Cena, and thank you, Phoenix. I am so proud of you. I'm going to hold it together so we can get through this. Okay. Um, so if we just kind of talk a little bit about the series. Dr. Amalfitano opened by talking about the fact this is the 24th year of this series. Um, I marvel at that. Um, but this series provides an opportunity to reflect on the richness of our histories and her stories, as well as to look forward, right, so that we are preparing uh, for thriving black futures. Um, I also, since this is our first time together since last year, um, I, I recognize that um, we've had some difficult moments in the past year, but we continue to press on. We persevere. Um, the other thing that I want to just remind us is that there are some things that we are celebrating this year. Um, some of you are aware that this is the 70th anniversary of Brown versus the Board of Education. It is also the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. And y'all know how I love music. Um, we are celebrating 50 years of hip hop and its con contributions to our culture. So you may have noticed that music is embedded into the series this year. Um, if you did a peek ahead, next year will be joined. Next week will be joined by MC Light, um, and uh, in our third week, we're going to have a concert. We're presenting a celebration of Black music and a live recording of our first ever 
Slavery to Freedom concert, which is led fully by um, students in the College of Music. So I'm really excited about that. I'm also um, overjoyed to reveal, as you can see projected behind me, the Storytelling Through Music collection. So it's projected here on the screen. Um, local artist Mila Lin created this 24-piece art installation to commemorate this 24th year of the Slavery to Freedom series. The collection features watercolor and oil paintings on sheet music, cassette tapes, and vinyl records, paying homage to the importance of music and black history and culture. The full collection is displayed across the hall um, where we'll be having our reception at the conclusion of this program. And you can chat with Mila um, and just hear how she was inspired to create each of the pieces. I wanna thank Mila for this incredible work. Um, I was just uh, breathless when it was revealed to me. Um, I wanna thank a lot of our friends, um, there are dignitaries in the audience. I will admit to you that I can't see very many of you at all. So <laughs> I wanna thank you for um, joining us. Um, I also wanna thank in particular Stratton Lee um, and Dr. Eunice Foster, um, who are members of MSU BFSAA. Thank you for joining us and your support. Um, I also want to do a special thank you. Um, we talk about designees. I want to thank our med student, OMS Megan McGrath, for running from class and being with us. Um, uh, yes, I want to celebrate you as we talk about our dignitaries because you are so valuable to us. So thank you for your work on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and thank you for being here. All right. So I'd like to introduce you to the first speaker of the 2024 Slave Reader Freedom Series. Okay, so y'all, I'm gonna read the bio, right? I need y'all to get ready. I don't know if you need to stretch or do a vocal exercise, because when she comes out here, we can't have the stale applause like in the beginning, okay? Okay. It's just the countdown. I need, we had a meeting about this, so y'all ready, y'all? Did you work your fingers and your elbows and shoulders? Okay. So Dr. Tanisha Ford is a foremost voice speaking on the intersection of politics, economics, and culture. She makes connections between the past and the present in ways that shed new light on today's most pressing social issues. She is professor of history and biography and memoir at the Graduate Center, CUNY. Dr. Ford has written four books, our Secret Society, Molly Moon, and the glamour, money, and power behind the civil rights movement, that one is fresh off the presses. She's written Dressed in Dreams, A Black Girl's Love Letter to the Power of Fashion, Kwame Braithwaite, Black is Beautiful, and the award-winning Liberated Threads, Black Women, Style, and Global Politics of Soul. She's currently working on a genre-bending book about sculptor and institution builder, Augusta Savage. If you're like me, I can't wait to read that. A dynamic speaker, Dr. Ford engages with national and international audiences about the cost of racial justice movements, the history of black mutual aid networks, philanthropy and civil rights movement, the Black Midwest, and the geopolitics of the fashion and beauty industries. She also conducts workshop, workshops on life writing, so memoir, biography, autobiography, and strategies for developing anti-racist philanthropic practices. Slavery to Freedom family, please welcome Dr. Tanisha Ford. Well, welcome to Michigan State University and welcome to the College of Osteopathic Medicine. I'm so excited to talk with you. Um, 
We're going to get started in just a second, but I want to remind the audience, um, when you walked in at the registration table, you should have received some note cards. Do we have note cards? Yes. Okay. So um, those note cards are for questions. So as we are chatting, if there are things you would like to ask Dr. Ford about, jot down a question and you can hand them to the ushers. At the end, we will have um, OMS McGrath um, go through them and she will field the questions from the audience. Okay. Nice. All right, so it is Black History Month. Um, I always say we're simultaneously celebrating black histories, black histories, and black futures. And so um, we like to start by giving gratitude for our ancestors, right? So um, those who have been um, important groundbreakers and trailblazers for us. Um, and I like to be careful to say that some of our ancestors have walked before us, some of them walk among us. So I know you have written an entire book <laughs> about one of the ancestors that is really important to you. Um, but I want to give you a moment um, to just speak the name or names of others who are important ancestors or trailblazers for you in your work. First, let me just say hi, hello, hello, everyone. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be here for many reasons. One, because I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Indiana, so coming back to this region feels like coming back home. I'm also a Big Ten graduate, you know, so I love the Big Ten. <laughs> and it's really an honor to be here with you, Dr. Gilbert, and, you know, the first day of Black History Month, and to be an opening act for MC Light and, <laughs> and Reverend Barber and the student concerts and all of that. This is amazing. So thank you all for being here. Um, this question about ancestors, you know, thinking about the ancestors really frames so much of what I do. Um, I really felt like I was called to history. Um, I didn't necessarily go into graduate studies thinking I was going to get a degree in history. I thought it was going to be English literature, in fact. Uh, but I do think that it's that strong calling, and and most um, intensely, I felt this under this desire to understand my own family's history. Like, how did my family get here from the U.S. South? Um, Alabama specifically, to the black Midwest. How are they instrumental in shaping the black Midwest? So it was really that personal quest that got me here. So I, I say that some of the most important ancestors for me are members of my own family. I think about my grandmother who fled Alabama with many young children. She was pregnant with my father at the time when she moved here and um, she, she did so in large part to flee um, a, a violent marriage. Um, and so many black women like her fled the, the South because of the horrors of the, you know, the Southern regime, but also because some of, of the interpersonal violence that they were experiencing in their own homes. So I've really been on a quest to piece together my grandmother's history. So it's people like her. It's also people like Nina Simone. My master's thesis was on Nina Simone, so I've been in love with her music and her activism. And she led me to people like Odetta and Miriam Makeba. Um, also people like Molly Moon, who's the subject of this book, who opened up so many doors for me to speak the name of women like Bessie Bearden, who's known for being the mother of the artist, um, Romy Bearden, but she was also an activist in her own right. Um, Augusta Savage, who, you know, of course, I'm writing that book on her. So there's just so many people who have shaped the work that I do and for whom I feel, to whom I feel indebted, you know, because they really, they not only blaze the trail, I, I really feel like they speak to me. And it, that became clear to me while writing Our Secret Society because I moved into Molly Moon's apartment, unbeknownst to me. I moved into her apartment on her floor. So I feel like I commune with her regularly, like especially while writing the book. I was like, wow, you know, in a parallel universe, we were neighbors, we're neighbors, right? So I, I believe that the ancestors walk among us. Thank you so much. I didn't realize that you had moved into her apartment building. That is impressive. Um, I wanna talk about uh, um, your work. And it really um, works to counter the erasure of black women. You've talked a little bit about that already in the first question. Um, and black women's involvement in freedom work. So you artfully write black women into our historical record. Um, and certainly those about civil rights strategizing and organizing, um, leading, 
Um, and then also the groundwork. Uh, can you share your process, right? So how is it that you go about breathing life into these herstories, especially those um, who have been undetected or hidden from us for such a long time? Yeah, you know, a lot of that work, I wish, well, I do think this is brilliant, but brilliant in a different way than you might expect. Um, so my first book, Liberated Threads, my parents grew up in the 60s, so I've always been fascinated with the 60s and the style of the 60s and the radical politics of the 60s. And going through my mother's old yearbooks from that time really led me to want to know more about how everyday black women, like my mom, were engaging in activism. My mother, like me, attended Indiana University for undergrad. And to be able to go on the campus and do archival research to trace you know, the history of my mom's era of, of black activism on campus was definitely a huge part of that process. So again, it's always for me about this sense of self-discovery while I'm also trying to tell these broader histories. And then also a desire to travel. In that first book, I had a dissertation fellowship at the University of London, and it was there that I did all this research on the British Black Panthers. But it was my desire just to see the world. You know, a black girl from the Midwest who's like, I want to get outside of the country. I want to travel. I want to experience the world outside of the U.S. And that led me to the Panthers and led me to women like Olive Morris, a Jamaican-born British activist who was instrumental in the black power movement in the U.K. and the black feminist movement in the U.K. So I would say that my approach is a blend of material cultural studies, so taking things like yearbooks and um, other family heirlooms, everyday objects, and then placing those things in conversation with material that I find in more formal archives. So personal letters and correspondence, old newspapers, political broadsides, passports even, um, and then also conducting my own original interviews. So I've interviewed members of the Black Panther Party in the US and the UK, I've interviewed fashion designers in South Africa. I interviewed the first black woman who uh, to be on the cover of the first South African, black South African woman to be on the cover of South African Cosmopolitan magazine. So I've just been able to you know, amass a series of oral interviews. Um, and not for this particular project, but I've also interviewed Oprah, for example, you know, so like I've just interviewed a ton of people and so that becomes another layer to the research. And I think that this range of source material gives the, the material a certain kind of life and energy and a richness that I think is, makes the history accessible to everyday folks, not just academic historians. And so I think when we read your work, we see that, right? And it's so important. Um, I, uh, Dr. Anthony Jack was here with us for the Health College's MLK um, presentation. And one of the things that he said that I remembered was, I don't wanna write anything that my mama wouldn't understand, right? So the importance of um, doing our work, but in a way that folks that maybe aren't in our institutions, that they can get it, that it's accessible to them they understand. So I'm going to give you a rather long lead in. Um, and then I'm going to let you just take over. Uh, and so I had to jot this down because I was thinking about um, both your second and your third books. Um, and so I shared with you earlier and in the reception, um, those books came out at a time when I was teaching and I got to teach um, black women for the first time. Um, freshmen, and seniors. Um, and so those two books were instrumental um, in those classes. Um, so you write powerfully about the significant role of fashion for black women and its intentional deployment, right? So, um, you know, black women are always intentional about how we represent our bodies, what we put on them. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and yes, right? And we make decisions about um, how we go out into the world sometimes for utility sometimes for safety, um, sometimes we may, we're making political decisions, sometimes we're doing things that are very symbolic. Um, I love my sister friend, Dr. Kennedy, who came in all pink. I don't know if she's still here. That was, she did that on purpose today, I picked it up. Oh yeah, in the all pink. Yes. <laughs> um, but we also have been able through fashion as black women to really shift the culture in important ways, right? Um, 
So if I think of examples of that, um, you know, even during slavery, the way in which we tied up our hair, mm -hmm. right, or the color of the head wrap had meaning. Um, the patterns of the ways our hair was braided had meaning and sometimes messages. Um, if I think about um, women, black women in the 1900s who were decidedly making some decisions, right? Um, they were really choosing this more professional um, aesthetic. And so for them, it was the very long flowing skirts, right? The high neck blouses. Um, in my era, and I think I'm a little older than you, um, bamboo earrings, at least two pair, and oh, I couldn't I had find my mine bamboo this morning. earrings. We overlapped because I right? had my bamboo right. earrings too. <laughs> um, and those hand painted jeans, right? Yes. Like all of that was very intentional, right? Um, and so, what I loved about those two books is you really kind of unpack that for us. Um, and sharing with my students, so this was my senior class, my black feminisms class, they loved liberated threads. Um, we did an entire unit and I think they were able to see us, black women, very differently, right? They were able to see us as leading in the civil rights movement and they were able to see us, again, as making conscious decisions every day about how I'm presenting my body out into the world. Um, I like that you talked about kind of this globalism because they liked seeing um, us as cosmopolitans. So learning about black women, um, shifting the culture here and in England and on the continent, that was really powerful for them. So I'll share with you one of the most poignant class sessions we had that semester um, happened when we unpacked your chapter on SNCC women. Um, we actually needed to reorient uh, the class because it carried over, but um, they were really interested in that conversation about um, what things to keep, perhaps from those, our predecessors, and what things they were wanting to discard. And so your rationale um, about dressing for respectability, particularly the SCLC, right, um, in this Sunday's best attire versus the SNCC women, right? Um, and they loved you talking about kind of natural hair and denim as a SNCC skin, right? Like that's just what we do. And there's a reason behind it, right? Um, I would add, and I told you backstage, they loved your reclamation and insertion of the Ladner sisters, right? And I think you have some photos of them. Um, so the question is this, so not many often link fashion, right, to freedom movements. Um, not many tend to think in that way. And, and so when I say fashion, I wanna be clear, right? Like, I'm not talking about these Eurocentric standards of like, this is what we're marketing today. I'm talking about um, the choices about hair, accessories, shoes, clothing, what I do wear, what I don't wear, right? The ways in which um, black women are cultural creators. So could you talk a little bit with the audience about how fashion is a useful tool, has been a useful tool for black women, certainly for our empowerment, or as you describe, in this way of embodiment of advocacy and activism? Yes, yeah, certainly, and thank you for teaching my work. You know, we, we write these books, and you don't know if people are gonna read them. You know, you don't know if they're gonna find an audience. You hope that they will be adopted in courses and that students will read the books and, and maybe they might shape their thinking, but you never know. So it's always good when people come back and tell you, hey, I've taught your work and you know, students really received it well. And so I appreciate that. And I appreciate you for sharing, sharing that news with me. Um, I kind of fell into that, the work on fashion and style and thinking about it as a tool of resistance. I, as I mentioned, my master's thesis was on Nina Simone. So when I embarked on that thesis, I was thinking about soul music and soul music as a tool of resistance and the kind of uh, political anthems that were produced during the civil rights movement and how those things we could should view them in conversation with the freedom songs and Negro spirituals and other things that became rallying cries at marches and so forth. 
Um, and, and at that time, music in the movement studies were quite popular. In fact, I, I did my master's at Wisconsin, another Big Ten school, and worked alongside Craig Werner, who was a big black music scholar. And <clears throat> I thought I was going to write a, a project that really worked on the music. But as I started to think about Nina Simone and later Odetta and Mary McCaba, I couldn't help but to... Uh, focus on their embodied presence, right? And how clothing was such a huge part of their stage performance and how they were wearing their hair natural and wearing African printed garments before these things were, were widely popular. And then there was also at that moment a push in black power studies to situate the start of the black power movement pre-1965, which sent me on a journey to then think, okay, well, I have these black women entertainers who are wearing their hair natural in the 1950s, um, and, and now we're thinking that we can find the roots of black power in an earlier era. Well, what else could we trace back to this earlier moment too? And so I started working on the SNCC chapter that was part of the dissertation. And then that chapter really took on a life of its own. So SNCC, for those who are unfamiliar, is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And it was an organization that was established in the early 1960s. It grew out of the sit-in movements. They were rippling across the South. And these were young people who were really pushing the, the, the strategy of direct nonviolent action by going into restaurants that upheld racial segregation and they were directly putting themselves on the other line of the Jim Crow color line to force integration. Okay, and so I came across the story of Ann Moody, which, you know, of course her memoir was very popular and widely taught, but I was struck by this notion that when she attends the March on Washington, she notices that she's coming dressed in her Sunday's best, but she looks around and all the other women of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee are dressed in denim overalls and jeans. So I was like, well, wow, you know, what we typically think about this earlier movement history, we think about the Sunday's best, we think about the SCLC, we think about, you know, these other more conservative church-based organizations, and here you had these black radical, you know, young college students and other people, you know, who were in their early teens and so forth, who were wearing denim, aligning themselves with Southern sharecroppers. So I wanted to like link that history to this history of Nina Simone and Odetta, or to see if there was a historical connection. And, and then I published that work as an independent article that I published it with the Journal of Southern History and I didn't know at the time that that was one of the first article length pieces published by a black woman in that journal. Um, so it became something of a groundbreaking article that they were very proud of, and that article also won awards. I wrote public-facing pieces on that SNCC work, so I'm really proud that that work lived on. So when it came time for me to write the book that would become Liberated Threads, this book that I originally thought was going to be about music and performance and stage and entertainment, I realized there was so much more to say about this dress piece and the class politics about, of this of dress and attire, and that it wasn't just about you know Sunday's best and respectability and, and the navigation of uh, notions of respectability to seem um, socially acceptable among you know, white folks so that people would have sympathy and, and really believe that we, we needed to fully integrate, that the story was far more complex. And it was a global story. And so that's what took me to the UK to do research there and to South Africa to do research there to really see, like, not only were, did we have the SNCC women who were wearing denim overalls aligning themselves with Southern sharecroppers, there were student activists in South Africa who would wear hot pants and stilettos as a way to thwart their own notions of respectability, Christian oriented respectability in South Africa. Specifically, I'm thinking about Joburg. And they would wear these hot pants and their stilettos and they would use the stilettos as weapons. So if they were attacked by the police, they could take off that stiletto heel and use it to protect themselves. So all these ways I was finding around, uh, across the African diaspora that black women, uh, women who were my age and even younger, were using these their dress as strategies of resistance. And I didn't include a picture of my mother in, 
in this slideshow here, but there's one of her in Liberated Threads. I'm really proud of it. It's her rocking her Angela Davis afro. She was so proud. She considered herself a student of Angela Davis in terms of her political ideology. So I grew up in this black radical, black feminist, pan-Africanist household. And, um, you know, so I think, so in writing my mother into this larger history, um, it was my way of honoring her, although she's, she's not an ancestor. And thank God I want her to be on this earth with me as long as I can have her. But when she does become an ancestor, like her, her work, her legacy li will live on alongside all those other women. So thank you for that. Um, I'm hearing the affirmation from our audience. Um, I want to shift a little bit. One of the things that I hope this series does um, that I think that you do well is to get us to think about freedom movements, right? So past, present, um, future, how are they connected, right? Or what are the things that we can build on? And um, as I read your book, we're going to shift to Molly Moon. Um, as I read your most recent book, um, she really kind of personifies this historical reference point um, for philanthropy as a freedom movement, right? So again, right, these two kind of areas that we don't traditionally think of in terms of freedom movements. Um, I find Molly Moon absolutely fascinating. Um, there are, every other week I have meetings on Wednesdays and Thursdays that start at 7.30 a.m. And um, I have to confess that I found myself in my bed with this book up to my chest trying to finish chapters um, before I forced myself to go to sleep because I had to get up very early the next morning. Um, Molly Moon is compelling in so many different ways. Um, and yet, there are people who have never heard her name, have no idea who she is, know nothing about her life. Um, and she is someone who um, really had an understanding of fundraising and community building, right? Um, across, um, I'm gonna use the word class, right? So working class, middle class black families, even affluent black fam families. Um, but she also had this way of tapping into um, the wealth, the resources of titans of industry, right? Um, and celebrity. So everybody from Harry Belafonte um, to the Rockefellers, right? And that's impressive, to, you know, to say the least. Um, so I'm going to read just a description that was given about her, but I would like for you then to really introduce Molly Moon to our audience, right? Um, so this description says, as the president of the National Urban League Guild, a fundraising arm of the National Urban League, Molly raised millions, right? And you can um, put that into context historically. Uh, so she raised millions to fund grassroots activists battling for economic justice and racial equity. She was a force behind the mutual aid network that connected black churches, domestic and blue collar laborers, social clubs and sororities and fraternities across the country. Can you introduce us to Molly Moon? Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce you all to Molly Moon. I stumbled across Molly Moon's name. I wasn't looking for her, I had never heard of her. <laughs> But after I had returned from London um, on that dissertation fellowship, I was at the Schomburg Center. This was around 2010. And I was doing research for the dissertation that I had put off writing because I was having too much fun in London. I, <laughs> I had a ball. Um, so then it was time to come back to the country and like really buckle down to get this dissertation written. So I was doing research at the Schomburg, actually looking for this woman who was uh, a model for uh, white owned wig shop in Harlem in the early 1960s. So I was searching for this woman and stumbled upon the name Molly Moon. And I just love the name Molly Moon. It just sounded so cool. Molly Moon. Ooh, a black woman named Molly. Now, this is before the TV show Insecure. So I didn't really know any black Mollies, you know? So I'm like, Molly Moon. Ooh, wow. And then I realized that she was this 
really glamorous woman who hosted this black beauty pageant. And you know, for the, the dissertation that became Liberated Threads, I was studying the black nationalist, Garveyite, you know, natural standard of beauty pageants that are happening in this one section of Harlem. And then you have Molly Moon and her beauty pageants happening in another section of Harlem, but they were both celebrating visions of black women's beauty. And uh, so I was taken with her and I just started to just search her name, you know, in newspapers to see what I could find. And before I knew it, I had amassed hundreds of newspaper clippings of this woman across the black press. And at, at its peak, you know, there are hundreds of black newspapers in the US and also in mainstream newspapers and magazines. So this woman was a veritable celebrity a social justice celebrity, if you will, in the civil rights era. And I thought, why don't we know her? Why don't we know her name? And I really made it a point to try to piece together her history. And at first I thought, because she hosted all these fabulous parties and you know, balls and galas and parties at her home and she knew everyone and was invited to everyone else's parties, I thought that she was a socialite. And I was framing her as such, like, oh, here's this socialite you know, who cared about justice. And it wasn't until I really started to work on the project in earnest, maybe around uh, 20, 2016, 2017, where I really started to sit down with all of the material that I had amassed in you know, the previous seven years or so, that I realized that at all of these events, there are number of uh, dollar amounts attached to these stories written about her, that these weren't just parties for party's sake, they were fundraisers that she was raising money for various civil rights movement causes. And then that made me think, wow, I'm a historian of the civil rights movement, but I never really thought about how is the movement funded, right? You have a march on Washington where a quarter of a million people are flooding into DC. Who's paying for the porta potties? Who's paying for the lunches? Who's, who's paying for the trains and buses and everything else that's bringing these people into the city? You have voter education uh, drives. Who's paying for these events? You have a voting, voting machines. Where do those voting machines come from? Who's supplying these things? If you have freedom rides and so forth, who's supplying the buses for the freedom rides? Who's paying for breakfast programs and after school programs for black youth? This money has to come from somewhere. And there's a way that you know we, we think that, that, or maybe we just don't even think about it at all, or, or, or we think that, this stuff can't really cost, but, but to create the world, the more just world we want to live in, in this country that's based on Jim Crow exploitation, it's based on, a, it's a nation built upon slave labor, it means that our version of freedom is always going to cost us. And that is a tragedy, right? And women like Molly Moon spearheaded the 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 capital campaigns that raised money for these initiatives that we just kind of take for granted. So she's working alongside people like Harry, Be Harry Belafonte, um, everyday people who you know were domestic laborers and so forth. Um, she's also coordinating with other guilds, which she establishes for the National Urban League. She establishes the National Urban League Guild, which becomes this major fundraising arm. So by the time we get to the March on Washington, there are guilds in, in every major city in the United States. And so, and these women have amassed their own local power. It gets to the point where local and state politicians have to come to these women's fundraising events to show their face because they want their constituents to believe that they, you know, care about racial, uh, racial um, the fight for racial equality. And so I was like, this is a story we don't know. And that doesn't even really get into the element of big foundation philanthropy and corporate philanthropy and the role that that played in terms of the fundraising piece and the conflicts within the black community about like, what, what would it mean to take money from the Rockefellers, from the Carnegie's, from the Mellons, um, from PepsiCo, from General Electric, you know, these organizations that at that time felt like it could be cool to align themselves with the movement and would make them look progressive if they did so. And you have people like Malcolm X, for example, among others who are saying, actually, this money is steering the movement away from the more grassroots, radical movements that we really need in order to uh, affect long-term change in this country. So the book really charts Molly Moon's rise to the Grand Dame of Harlem 
uh, while also telling this very undertold study, uh, story about black philanthropy, mutual aid networks in our community, and the ways in which we've had to navigate what political scientist Megan Mean Francis terms movement capture, right? So for me, this is, um, I think it's some of my best work to date, in part because I can see my maturity as a researcher and writer. Um, the, 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 the graduate student who produced what would become Liberated Threads has matured into a more seasoned historian and, and storyteller, and I think I, in this book I bring all of those skills to bear. And I must say, I'm gonna toot my own horn for just a quick second, so bear with me. The book was named to several best of lists, including Vanity Fair named it named Our Secret Society, one of its best books of 2023, Ms. Magazine did as well. And I was recently nominated for an NAACP Image Award for- Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> for, um, for outstanding literary work in the um, category biography, autobiography. So I'm just loving the fact that even though people have not heard this woman's name, they're open to hearing this story and being guided into another way to think about movement work and how black women's stories get us there. You know, because Molly Moon herself was not born into an affluent family. She was born in the Jim Crow South in Hattiesburg, Mississippi in 1907, and was really raised that hard work and education was the route to freedom, you know? So I loved piecing together her narrative. Thank you for that. Um, so some of your work talks about philanthropy. Um, I wanna get into that a little bit. Um, what we learn in your book, um, some of us know from experience, is that black philanthropy is well established, right? Um, it's not something that sprang up last week, right? Um, it is um, a part of our communities um, that has really helped us in terms of not just funding our freedom movements, but really pushing us into, our, into getting us free, right? Um, so with Molly's life as a lens, um, I think you, really help us see some of that infrastructure, right? So you talked to us, talk to us about the cost, right, of our movement building and, and freedom work. Um, but Molly's life really shows us that there was actually an intentional and purposeful infrastructure. Um, you call it a black freedom financial grid. This really well-organized philanthropic giving to support civil rights advocacy. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, how was it curated? Um, and then how did we really deploy that? Yeah, so it was important for me um, in writing this book, let me just say, Molly Moon has two repositories um, in, the, in the US. So one in Cleveland, so I was able to do research at the Western Reserve Historical Society, and one in, in Harlem at the Schomburg. It's a joint collection with her husband, Henry Lee Moon, who went on to be the publicity director of the NAACP. And I, I was very fortunate to have such rich archival material to draw from which often isn't the case when you're studying black women and other minoritarian subjects. And through those letters, I was able to learn so much about her politics, how she saw the world. She was part, she, a lot of her fundraising and her vision for philanthropy really grew from her communist roots. She was part of a group of people along with Langston Hughes, Dorothy West, Louise Thompson Patterson, and others who traveled to Moscow in the early 1930s to make a racial propaganda film about the horrors of Jim Crow segregation and labor exploitation in the United States. The film was never made, but Molly was deeply influenced by socialism. And it was something that she, I think she understood acutely as someone who grew up in a working class family and saw the importance of mutual aid networks, particularly among migrant communities, because as a young child, she and her mother migrated, much like my, my grandmother who was leaving a bad marriage and moving to the North, Molly and her family moved to Cleveland. And so she saw this kind of mutual aid among black people. She saw the labor exploitation of factory workers, the men in her family who worked in factories. So a lot of her understandings of mutual aid were, were not shaped by this very 20th century vision of philanthropy in which we link philanthropy to extremely wealthy, mostly white, mostly males, right? 
and and then that led me down a path to learn more about the history of philanthropy in this country. And my colleague, Car Kathy McCarthy, does great work on this to help us realize that the language of philanthropy predates the notion of the, the robber baron or the, you know, the titan of industry of the 20th century or the industrial age or the gilded age. And that in fact, even enslaved Africans were using the language of philanthropy to talk about their own giving. Um, it was a language that um, abolitionists also were using. And it wasn't something that was just unique to people with money and education. So part of this was me returning to these very non-Western notions of giving. So Susu giving circles and other uh, Ubuntu principles and other giving traditions that come from the African continent that were nurtured in, in, in the Caribbean and then brought to the U.S. South and other parts of the U.S. So this is what's shaping the vision of, of philanthropy that I write about in the book. And while we can see African Americans, once we get on the other side of World War II, who do start to adopt certain notions of the wealthy philanthropist, there's also a way that they are pushing back against this construction of what it means to be a philanthropist, and they're drawing upon those very horizontal mutual aid networks and not so much that hierarchical notion of um, noblesse oblige or the, the wealthy 1% tossing money down from their gilded towers to the quote unquote unwashed masses, right? So African Americans, even the celebrities like Joe Lewis and Jackie Robinson and Bill Bojangles, Bojangles Robinson and um, Marian Anderson and Harry Belafonte, who become the face of black philanthropy, celebrity philanthropy in the mid 20th century, even they aren't um, beholden to those more mainstream notions of philanthropy. So it was important for me to recover that history and put it front and center, especially as I was writing. I mean, I'm writing amidst this pandemic, and we're seeing all these you know, stories about wealthy philanthropists guilt giving, you know, or at least pledging to give to Black Lives Matter and other movement organizations in present day. And, you know, corporations doing this mea culpa about, you know, we're gonna improve, we're gonna be anti-racist, we're really gonna walk in this. And seeing this unfold in an earlier time period and seeing how in, in the present day, so many of the names who became the faces of this, people like Mackenzie Scott, for example, um, Th their names are attached to this generous, this generosity. Not the everyday African Americans and people of African descent in this country who sustain the movements even when it's not cool, hip, or trendy to do it, right? So I wanted to honor those giving traditions and uh, to tell, use Molly Moon to do a middle out approach where I did a bottom up, so uh, telling this history using a grassroots you know, lens, but also, you know, looking at this top down, like what does it mean when we don't make the black middle class the villain of the story, but when we see that there's this other hand of white philanthropy that's a part of the story too, like how does that add complexity? So that middle out approach allowed me to see the bottom up and the top down as well. So uh, we learn that uh, not everything in Molly Moon's life is all glamor and celebrity, right? Um, as I read your book, I was really intrigued by this really systematic, orchestrated um, uh, plan of attack, right? So to really um, to take her down, right? Take her down a peg. Um, some of them personal, some of them very professional attacks, right? Um, and it was really this idea um, of undermining her power, right? She's too powerful. So we need to eliminate her. Um, I often, uh, in this work, try to think about, yes, some of our ancestors and trailblazers, and then those folks who are now actively doing the same work, or um, right now the word that's in my head uh, is legacy, so those of us who are inheriting the legacy. Um, I'm really thankful for Dr. Keisha Harris, um, whose work uh, is an organizational change, right? But I see her as, um, again, one of these women who inherit Molly Moon's legacy. Um, I'm thankful to her uh, because last week, um, she shared um, some insight about um, a phenomenon called pet to threat, 
this idea um, of black women uh, as pets to threat. Like we move, we experience that, we move through. So some of you are like, what does that mean? Here's what I mean. We are loved on and cradled and celebrated and um, given uh, special places and, and, and spaces of privilege until we ask questions, until we start to um, hold people accountable, until we challenge the ways of operation, certainly in ways that might disrupt what is or dismantle what is, right? And at that point, right, this moment when we go from being um, lovely accessories to a handful were then a threat that must be dealt with. So um, I'm gonna ask you um, to speak more specifically to Molly's pet to threat experience because it's, um, it's amazing to me that you write again at, about this time period but when I read it, it resonates so, I mean, I can think of probably seven black women today, right, that have had similar con um, experiences, right? Everything from body shaming to um, rumors about her sexuality um, or just ways to publicly um, take her down. So if you could kind of talk to us about that and more specifically, right, like I don't want to get into just the salacious bits, but because I see um, these parallels, do you think that there are some lessons to be gleaned, right? Um, sounds like maybe there are some folks in this room that know right. a little something about that, right? right. So is there um, some advice that you might offer? I feel like there was a round of like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And, and that's one thing I love about Molly Moon as a figure. <clears throat> She's so complex, and I didn't want to round out or smooth out any of that complexity. I wanted to hold her in all of her dimensions and all her flaws and imperfections in the fullness of her humanity. Because I think that that's where the real truth telling lies. And that's when we get at a human experience that's so relatable to other people, specifically black women who are working in this space. So in many ways, this, this book is a love letter to black women in leadership positions um, who endure that kind of um, everyday threat, violence, personal attacks, microaggressions as we often call them. Um, it's, and I mean leadership, in your, 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 your local community group, your, your job um, at your church, in your NAACP or Urban League chapter, not to s single out those organizations in particular, but I'm just saying in a range of ways, when we're in leadership positions, in our corporate jobs, in our academic jobs, you know, we, we experience this pet to threat that you're talking about. And in Molly Moon's case, she's a social worker by day, but she becomes, as I said, one of the leading fundraisers in the United States by the time we get to the 1950s. And I've spoken with so many black women who are working in the nonprofit space, in the foundation philanthropy space, in development offices, in DEI, who are saying that like, when I read this book, I saw that not much has changed. It, it made me just shocked and awed at like how the struggles we're experiencing today are the things that you're writing about with Molly Moon. These very systemic issues around giving and you know creating real social change in terms of giving practices across the board with organizations. I mean, Ms. Foundation did this amazing study in 2020 that exposed the fact that black women-led nonprofits um, are woefully underfunded compared to their counterparts that are led by white men and women. So Molly Moon, um, she, as I mentioned, she, she comes into her work with the Urban League with this more radical politic. I mean, she had been organizing alongside, like I said, Louise Thompson Patterson and Islanda Robeson and other 
black women who are part of that left wing. And, you know, she cuts her teeth as a fundraiser with the Harlem Community Arts Center in the, the late 1930s and early 40s. So when she moves into this role with the National Urban League, the Urban League is now pivoting toward uh, soliciting donations from big dollar donors in the New York, you know, I call it the, um, the Upper East Side elite, right? So they're taking money from the leaders of industry and so forth. And so Molly Moon then becomes the face of this type of giving. And it thrusts her into a spotlight in a way that elevates her. Um, and, and for a woman who's very glamorous, I mean, there's certain things about this that are very appealing, but the downside of this is that she's attacked regularly in the press. Um, they do body shame her. She is what today we would call a curvy black woman. and the newspapers, you know, followed her weight loss and gains and wrote about this regularly. Today we call this bat phobia. They did so much of this to attack her. Uh, they spread rumors about her having an affair with Winthrop Rockefeller because if she was working so closely with him and he's giving millions of dollars to even to fund things, including building a new uh, headquarters for the National Urban League, that she must be sleeping with him? What what other reason would this white man have to give money to a black woman? Now, of course, this, is, this happens in the late 1940s at a moment where uh, sex across the color line is illegal in many states in the United States, where black men and women are being uh, sexually assaulted and lynched, murdered uh, for um, even being perceived as having interracial sex. So she's being attacked in these ways later on. Even men within the National Urban League are angered by the kind of power that Molly Moon and the women of the Guild have amassed and the sway they have with local media and politicians. And so you can see sexism rampant even within the organization. And there's a slide um, on the, the slideshow there where you can see that she sues this white woman millionaires for a million dollars in 1965 dollars uh, for slander, for basically, saying that she's loose and lascivious and spreading this rumor around the National Urban League. And so I tell this story about like why we get to this point and why she sues this woman, right? And so it was important for me to, to show the, the, doubt, the perils of doing this fundraising work for black women and to also show that, as you said, once you start asking questions about where this money is coming from, where it's going, um, people, people then, you know, start to see you as more of a threat, or <clears throat> the the issues that that mainstream philanthropy still has today is not for lack of innovation. When I speak to black women working in this space today, they regularly tell me they have all these brilliant and amazing ideas for fundraising, community building, networking, and so forth. It's that this system, which itself is rooted in a capitalist system that's rooted in white supremacy and this history of chattel slavery in the United States and also just in the, the, the global West, um, it means that philanthropy, big foundation philanthropy is also rooted in this. So these small reforms don't really do the work to change big philanthropy. So it really takes um, a more concerted work to take the kind of infrastructure building that Molly Moon and other black women who walk in her legacy have done to really implement those things. And it became increasingly more frustrating for Molly Moon and other black women who are doing this work in the era of Jim Crow where they're essentially building a black nonprofit sector because mainstream social services are not attending to the needs of the black poor and working poor, right? So they're constantly butting up against big philanthropy and corporate philanthropy as it continues to expand across the 20th century and more tax laws are made to accommodate this kind of you know, fundraising and giving and donations as a form of tax write-off for this you know, growing philanthropic sector. So all of that stuff is in the book. So for people who really care about that kind of material, that's there. If you're just here for the beautiful gowns and the galas, that's there too. If you're interested in the, the salacious stories about the scandals, Scandal Darling, it abounds in the book too. It's like a really layered piece, you know? <laughs> okay, so um, 
I have been wanting to write things down the whole time, so I'm gonna pause to say, um, if you have not jotted down some questions, now is a good time to start thinking about what you wanna ask. Um, okay, so Dr. Ford, uh, reading your book, I also thought about another, I would call her phenomenal woman who works in this space. Um, so her name is Christy Wallace Slater. Um, and I see her again as a, a beneficiary of Molly's legacy. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her, but I'm gonna um, paraphrase a description of her work. Um, so while at the Foundation for Louisiana, Christy supported the development and growth of uh, the Foundation's program-related investment fund and managed the Foundation's grant portfolios. This foundation, the Foundation for Louisiana, was initially founded as the Louisiana Disaster Recovery Foundation. Um, so it was established really to meet the immediate needs um, of, of residents of New Orleans um, and Louisiana in those immediate days after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Later at the W. Kellogg Foundation, she focused specifically on the greater New Orleans area, designing and implementing national grant initiatives, sound familiar? Uh, Place-based work and multi-year projects that affect systematic change and program strategy. So now, um, Christy works as Vice President for Programs at the Women's Foundation of the South. Right, a public foundation led, led by and working for women and girls of color in the southern United States. So I'm intentionally connecting these two women, right? I'm sure in the description you've heard some similarities. Um, because again, uh, philanthropy, black giving, and the legacy of black women at the helm of these efforts, right? Um, it spans our past, our present, and our future. So in a lot of ways, I see Christie's work as kind of the manifestation of Molly's freedom dreams, or her freedom dreaming. You describe Molly's early work as place-based efforts that kind of begin in Harlem, and the more she learns, the more she's growing, right? And so um, it then comes to include national initiatives and projects. I always um, think it's important to talk about freedom dreaming in this series. Um, but what I appreciate about Molly is that she's freedom dreaming while she's feverishly working at the building right, the creating, the sustaining, and she's working um, kind of through this lens of uh, philanthropy and policy and building this legal infrastructure as well to support freedom work. So um, could you talk a little bit about how she kind of, you know, you talked earlier about going from social work to really growing into this um, powerhouse. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and, and first let me say I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned Christy's name because when I I interviewed a lot of black women who work in the nonprofit space today, it's particularly around issues related to economic and social justice. <clears throat> and one thing that I learned or that I could start to map a genealogy of based on those interviews was that we can think of philanthropy, particularly black philanthropy, black justice-oriented philanthropy as diff having different schools of thought. And oftentimes there are major moments in history that shape those various schools of thought. So one of those moments is, of course, you know, the fight for the abolition against you know enslavement, um, the civil rights, the Depression era. You know, we see a, a shift in school of thought, and so that's why. And this is the era where Molly Moon really cuts her teeth as an intellectual and a thinker, as a, you know, a Marxist social theorist. Um, She's forming relationships with people like Polly Murray, who will go on to do such amazing legal theory that becomes the foundation for a lot of the work that Thurgood Marshall gets credit for in terms of um, the case that becomes Brown v. Board of Education. So these are Molly's intellectual peers as well, and so that becomes a major um, shift in school of thought once the civil rights movement amps up in the early 1960s. We see another shift, when, particularly when Whitney Young takes the helm of the National Urban League. And 
There's another shift that happens too, like around you know the Reagan years, but when I talk to activists working today, they talk about Christie and other black women in the South, in New Orleans in particular, who create a new school of thought around philanthropy and fundraising and mutual aid because of Katrina. Right, and so, and that's work that I can't wait to see the work that historians will do, and I hope in that way my work is a certain kind of blueprint that helps us to chart some of these changes in schools of thought, so that it illuminates that work even more for historians. That like this becomes a major um, watershed moment in terms of Black fundraising, philanthropy, and mutual aid, and a redefinition of the kind of works that we're using 501c3 status to do in the global South. So. Um, I wanted to just name that. Um, Molly herself, you're right, she's definitely in invested in this you know, very place-based activism and infrastructure work. And it's important to note that as I mentioned, in this time period where she's raising funds, um, African Americans, particularly the majority of African Americans who are li living at or below the poverty line are not benefiting from social services. They are not benefiting from the New Deal. So you have people like social workers like Molly Moon who have this skill set and a knowledge base that is really makes them prime figures to be leading voices in this fundraising and the establishment of a nonprofit sector, right? So, and, and to use a more radical approach to the 501c3, which in itself is kind of at odds because for people who understand tax law, with a 501c3 designation, you're not supposed to be a political entity. So there's ways that the NAACP with a, with a 501c4 status can be more engaged in political protests, whereas the National Urban League could not. So there's ways that they're trying to get around this, and there's moments where it looks like that they could see a more radical future for themselves, and that's the moment where Molly Moon is brought in. So a lot of the infrastructural work she's doing is coming, again, from this Marxist orientation around providing social services to black communities. And she and her husband, who is a leading journalist of the day, who's writing about reparations and ending lynching and so forth, like they are, you know, leading voices in this public conversation. Um, and once the organization decides to pivot away from that style of activism and fundraising, it creates all of these tensions. It, and this is when we see people like Ella Baker leave the National Urban League and, and even leaving the NAACP and realizing that I cannot work within these structures, that the promise that they showed, and there's, I found this debate in the, that she has in the Baltimore Afro-American about this very issue, I'm talking about Ella Baker here, like what the National Urban League could have been, right? And so it was important for me to link Molly Moon to that moment to say like, here was a woman who was doing this fundraising work that you know, people like Ella Baker are doing sort of like quote unquote front lines activists work around and intellectual work. Well, Molly Moon was an intellectual too who's also thinking about these big picture questions. So, I think, the, again, this is part of that hidden history. And, and so in addition to this more you know, Marxist-oriented vision of a, a more uh, radical democratic vision, she's also paying homage to the, the four mothers who are doing these fundraisers in the church. You know, now the building fund, the new building might have never been built, but it wasn't, it wasn't because the fund monies didn't exist. Those chicken dinners and other things were raising money. There's a picture in the slideshow of Georgia Gilmore, a food activist in Montgomery who was a major fundraiser for the Montgomery uh, bus boycott. She and her group, the Club From Nowhere, raised, they, they sold these chicken and pork chop dinners and delectable desserts and other things to raise money to fund an alternative bus service. I mean, a you know, transportation service. If you're not gonna ride the bus, well, how are people gonna get to work? How do you fund this alternative system? Well, is Georgia Gilmore, who was a midwife and a cook and a domestic laborer who spearheaded that work. So even though you know, we're reclaiming Rosa Parks, which is so important too, and you know, Claudette Colvin and other names, but these domestic workers like Georgia Gilmore are still remain behind the scenes even though they were raising all the money, 
right? So Molly Moon is paying homage to these women. And so it was important for me as a black feminist historian and a black women's historian, this is something I didn't even have to create. It was right there in the archive. It's black women who reclaim Molly Moon. After she is pushed to the margins of Whitney Young's National Urban League, it's black women journalists and rising civic leaders and rising fundraisers who say, we're not gonna put Molly Moon in the corner because she's done all this work for the Urban League over, you know, at this point it was nearly 50 years that she had done this work without really the recognition that she deserved. And so it was beautiful to be able to write in the conclusion that the reason why we have a Molly Moon Volunteer Fundraiser Award today that's given by the National Urban League is because black women reclaimed her. So the work that I'm doing in repositioning her in the movement narrative is also work that's built upon the work that black women in the 1970s and 80s had done. My goodness. Um, you have given us so much this evening, and I know um, we took a world tour around a lot of topics. Um, you are brilliant. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you are brilliant. <laughs> thank you, I'll take that. Um, so this is the professor in me. So let me just share with you all. Um, it's always interesting for me to try to think about questions because I try um, to look at the span of your work. I try to look at um, the growth, as you say. Um, I was so excited to sit down with you this evening to open Black History Month. Um, for the audience, I wanna share, I wanna take you behind the curtain. So there's two things that I want you to leave with from my side of this conversation this evening. So we work in higher ed, right? Um, you heard Dr. Ford say, you know, we write these books, we don't know if anybody's gonna read them. That's our work, y'all. So when I told her, I, t I taught her work, when we're creating our syllabi, that's our work. The same work of reclaiming black women that Dr. Ford has done, that's what we can do, right? So that um, our students know these narratives, right? Know what's possible for them, right? That they don't even have to start at zero. There's all this groundwork that they can build on that's the first thing. The second thing um, that I kind of want to say to us is these are well-established legacies, right? Um, last year, someone said it very simply, just, just trust black women, right? Ask us some questions. We know a lot of stuff, yes. <laughs> right? Our mamas, our grandmamas, um, our aunties, right, they have been telling us about their lives, right? And that too is a form of scholarship. I wanna thank you for making it just so accessible for us. Um, I wanna thank you for your work. So before we go to our audience questions, Megan, are you ready? You can get in position. I just have a lightning round really quickly. Oh, All right. Lightning round, okay, I feel like I'm on a talk show, game show. Let's All go. Right. Let's see, I'm ready. Okay, so what is the one piece in your wardrobe right now that you are obsessing over? I bought these gold sequin boots. Come on, they're now. thigh high boots, and I haven't worn them anywhere yet. You know, so oh. I, I got to figure out a place to wear these boots, and then when I do, I'll post them on in Instagram. So okay, perfect. Them. We're gonna look for that. Um, her handle is Soul Sister PhD. I just, in case y'all want to see the gold boots. Um, what was one of your favorite things about our celebrations of 50 years of hip hop? You love music like I love music, so. Okay, listen, I am, I'm not a starstruck person, but I love Queen Latifah. Mm -hmm. And I love seeing her be front and center and rapping again on the stage. I mean, she's so multi-talented. Mm -hmm. uh, so I loved the moments that we got to see the black women shine. So I'm so mm -hmm. glad you're having an MC Light here. You know, of course, I'm of that era mm -hmm. where I was deeply yes. influenced by Light and the Queen and all those folks. So yeah, I love seeing, seeing that part of the tribute. So this is probably the most important question I have asked you all night long. Okay, I know you said you are a woman from the Midwest. Yes, I eat spaghetti with fish. Is that the uh, question? I, no. I'm from the South, I eat it too. <laughs> um, uh, it's an equally important question. <laughs> On your grits, sugar or salt? Oh, it got silent, wait a minute. 
You let me just say, mine was a house divided. Okay, <laughs> my father ate the savory grits, my mother ate the sugar grits. Okay. You know, so so I eat both, and sometimes at the same time. Okay. I must admit. So yes. Yeah, so, so our last question: What is Dr. Tanisha Ford Freedom dreaming about? Oh, ooh, what am I dreaming about? Okay, so many things. Um, a new house. <laughs> These are practical things. Like these are real practical, like for real, for real, black girl things. And I want to take a trip where I can hit up maybe. Like I want to, I want to live abroad for maybe two to th two years, like just to live abroad and experience the world. Now, in terms of political freedom dreaming, I would love to see a ceasefire in the in the Middle East. Um, I raised a black boy, and even though he's now a young black man, um, he doesn't live in my house. He's at another Big Ten school. He's at Iowa getting his degree. And uh, <laughs> um, I dream of a world where I don't have to worry that he's going to be killed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Slave Reader Freedom family, Dr. Tanisha Ford. Thank you. Is this on? Okay. <laughs> um, so, hi. First, I want to just say thank you so much. Uh, this was really wonderful. Um, thank you. And now we're going to go through some of the audience questions. Uh, the first is there is a concern that our black magazines of the past are being discarded. How can we make sure that hard copies of black magazines are saved for this new generation? Ooh, that's a great question. And it, and it too is tied to this issue of fundraising because, you know, one of the things, and I see this just in my own personal archive, space is such a huge issue. Right, and so the, you have to have funding in order to support the collecting of these things and to be able to maintain them um, in archives that will adequately preserve them. Uh, so it's a, an initiative that I believe I've seen, is it like the Whitney and what's the one in, in LA? There's another foundation that's working with Ebony Magazine to pre preserve these things, the, the, not the, it's Guggenheim. Maybe it's the Guggenheim is involved with this too. Maybe the Ford Foundation is also trying to provide some funding for this. But it's a massive issue. Um, and the, I think the other piece of this is that so many of us have issues of Ebony and Jet that become family heirlooms and collector's items. So I'm also thinking about like how do we preserve those things too? So there's also, I think we need to have a greater emphasis on um, how, how we can do community-based archival work that allows people to take these incredible things that we have in our own homes and deposit them in community archives that become accessible to people. Because even when I was writing this book and I wanted to use images from Ebony and Jet, it was so hard to figure out how to even get the permissions to use them because of the ways that uh, these archives have now been housed and digitized, but kind of not, and who owns the rights to them. So it's complicated, it's a complex situation, but I definitely agree that in addition to the kind of Google search tools where you can find digital versions, we have to figure out the hard, the hard copy issue as well. Thank you. Um, can you talk about the important role black women played in lifting Molly up after she was ostracized? Yeah, so <clears throat> as I mentioned, by the early 1960s, there are Urban League Guild chapters across the country. And it's also fueled by the, the second wave of the Great Migration, where you have black people moving to places like um, Grand Rapids, Michigan, for example. There was a major Guild chapter there, Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, where I'm from, um, Louisville, Kentucky, Memphis, Tennessee, Phoenix, Arizona, Miami, Florida, Houston, Texas. I mean, just all across the map, you have these guild chapters that are popping up. And so when, when Whitney Young takes the lead of the National Urban League, he marginalizes Molly Moon. And what I see her do is 
rejoin her sorority. She's a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And so she re she reactivates in the organization and she starts doing black women centered community based work through Alpha Kappa Alpha, through other black women, uh, social justice organizations in New York City. She becomes one of the uh, first board members of the um, the hundred black women um, it becomes like a national organization, but when it's still just a local organization, she becomes one of the first board members. And so she focuses her attention on black women's issues and she's working in community with black women. And so she's taking her knowledge and her experience as an institution builder and she's applying it to black women's issues. And I think that's one of the main reasons that black women rally around her. And it was really beautiful to see in the archive stories where, you know, after Bali has put on this signature fundraiser, the Beaux Arts Ball, for many, many decades at this point, Vernon Jordan, who takes over the, the Urban League after Whitney Young dies, and other men take the stage at this event and they're taking all the credit and, you know, shaking the hands of the celebrities and the politicians who are there. And then the black woman writes in her column in the Amsterdam News that, Black women are gonna have their own event and we're gonna celebrate Molly Moon and she'll be able to give her own welcomes at, her, at this event, right? Because at her own event, they wouldn't allow her to take the stage. So it was great to see black women like calling the men out in the press, you know, like really saying, hey, we ride for this woman and you know, she's ours and we won't allow you to push her to the margin. So I love to being able to see how she, I think her move toward black women's work explicitly, I think paved the way for that kind of intergenerational connection between her and black women. Uh, thank you. What is your opinion on white organizations willing to support black movements, but not publicly tie themselves to the work? Mm, many thoughts. I could give a whole <laughs> lecture and have on this topic alone. You know, I think one of the, One of the things that I realized writing this book, and it's one of the reasons why I really had to lean into the joy aspects of the book, because I didn't want this book to just be so depressing, like, you know, nothing's changed, and you know, it's Jim Crow 2.0, or whatever we're living through now, or whatever, and it's, because a lot of that really is true, and you can see so many of these things. What I found really disturbing was not just putting their name on the work, or whether or not they do that, but the ways that they've cre they created organizations, philanthropic foundations, corporations, how they created all these barriers in terms of who they would fund. So if your agenda was too radical, they wouldn't fund you. If you didn't have an annual audit, they wouldn't fund you. If you um, didn't know somebody who knew somebody, they wouldn't know, even know about your organization to fund it. So that was part of the problem. But then they created this grant system where organizations like the NAACP and the Urban League had to apply for funding through these foundations. And the way that I would apply for, you know, that this money that's gonna give me a chance to live abroad for two years, right? Like they were literally applying our leaders were run out of the Urban League office or the NAACP office was firebombed. The White Citizens Councils forced us out of the community chest so we don't have funding. So now we have to come hat in hand to beg you for money and there are all these stipulations on how the money can be used. What kind of support, programming they would be willing to support and in most cases, even in these, these large civil rights organizations that had a long track record of work in the communities, they couldn't, they weren't even being trusted enough to use the money where it was needed most. These organizations tended to, wanted to want to fund youth programs because they wanted to get the black male you know, perpetrator off the street. So if we funnel more money into youth programs, that's a way to, to end street crime and street violence. You know? Or they would put money into the, the sciences, funding sciences, which is beautiful. We need STEM research. But the money couldn't actually go to fund impoverished black communities and families, people who are you know, recently um, released from incarceration. None of the money was going toward any, even to keep the lights on in the building, the money couldn't go toward that. So to me, that's one of the biggest shames. And if you talk to people working in nonprofit spaces today, those 
giving practices are almost identical today. And I spent a lot of time in the foundation records to look at this um, in the 50s and 60s. So I think that's one of the bigger problems rather than slapping one's name on the thing and saying, look, we're supporting this organization. It's like, but is the work that you're doing to support the organization really supporting the organization? Can we do like two more? Yes. Okay. I'll be brief too. I'll <laughs> Um, how do we move forward to help Gen Z pick up as leaders of civil rights when things like affirmative action and other programs are seen as not needed or as negative platforms that leave white men on the sidelines? Yes, I mean, of course, this is a major issue. Uh, we see the retrenchment of DEI initiatives across the board. We see an attack against um, critical race theory or this specter that the conservative right has called critical race theory. Um, we see the banning of books, schools not wanting to teach histories of enslavement, um, a, a banning of certain books in the curriculum. Our young people who do have their own freedom dreams are up against these major structural challenges as we move into another wave of white supremacy and anti-black violence, fascism. I mean, it's, it's true. Like you, but our people have always had to organize amidst these things. There was never a perfect or ideal moment. And this is when I turn to a person, someone like a Claudia Jones or a Louise Thompson Patterson or a Malcolm X who remind us of the importance of grassroots organizing and that kind of radical grassroots work that the hip hop generation calls for us, by us. We've always had to do that kind of work. And it's also why I think that even in the era of integration, we do really have to appreciate and support our HBCUs as training grounds for our, our black students and not just rely on these major foundations and families to give you know huge donations to our schools, but to also see these places as a vital training ground. So even when Harvard is firing, um, is black woman president. There are other institutions of higher learning that will welcome our, our young folks. So um, it, it's really a complex matrix. And I hate that, that that work falls disproportionately on black shoulders and black women's shoulders to figure out the solutions to global systems of oppression that we did not create. That was a great answer, thank you. <laughs> and I said I was going to be brief, but I started preaching. Good Lord, okay. We appreciate it. Um, I apologize that we do not have time to finish all of these questions, um, so I do encourage everyone to stay and keep talking. Um, but I think we can close off with this one. Uh, economics or fundraising is not often given a clear spotlight when talking about civil rights or prompting change. How did Molly Moon and other historical figures bring it to the forefront during their time? Yeah, so let me just say that one thing, you know, when <clears throat> I, I was telling a colleague friend who's a, a leftist activist and who does a lot of work with labor unions, that I was writing this book and she was like, what, you're gonna like follow the money? She said, wow, because in the world of activism, and we've seen this play out in our day, People use money and following the money trail as a way to attack civil rights leaders, right? To, to say uh, you were negligent with the money that you were given. You're not a good steward over the money that you've, you've been given. That you know the white hand of philanthropy has been generous with its giving and giving you all this money and look how you've squandered it. And that becomes a way to attack our movements and attack our movement leaders. And so I was really struck by how much that was part of the conversation then, that money became a way uh, to divide the movement. Um, it created um, division within organizations in terms of how we take the money and from whom, and who's the sellout for taking the money, who's the true freedom fighter because they didn't take the money. You know, it also, when you follow that money path, you see People like Harry Belafonte, who I admire in so many ways, but how he too gets kind of caught up in this, this space where he's 
giving money to SNCC, and he's doing very vital fundraising in many ways, but he also has the ear of the White House and JFK, and he doesn't want to lose that spot in the room. And so JFK is also manipulating him in many instances to get SNCC to do things that JFK wants them to do, to really tamp down that movement. So I was really struck by like all the conversations around BLM today, um, and what it means to try to establish a fund, which I have my own thoughts about why we're always gonna face challenges when we try to work within these structures like funds and 501c3 designations, which were never meant to hold black justice work. They just, those, those systems were never meant for us. Those financial structures were never meant for us. But to watch that play out in the past. And so I really want people to read this book so that they can understand where we've come from and the challenges that we face in the past and, and what worked and what didn't work. Thank you so much. So Dr. Ford, we wanna be able to say thank you to you. Um, you know what? <sighs> There just aren't even the words. Um, we, I think many of us have been just overwhelmed just to hear, first of all, your wealth of knowledge, but to again, reframe this idea that there are other freedom movements that we don't typically think of first. Um, and so, okay, so <laughs> we wanna say thank you to you. We, I don't have a copy of it, but um, you're going to receive a print, a poster print of the artwork as our oh, gift wow. to you for being a part Thank of the you. series this year. So um, that will be for you. Um, we have a second thank you, and it is um, a tribute in your honor, signed by Governor Gretchen Whitmer, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist II, Senator Sam Singh, and State Representative Julie Brixey. Oh, wow, wow, <laughs> I feel official. And if you will allow me, I'm gonna step aside for just a second and ask Natavia Curry and Sandra Seaton to come to the podium for a special presentation. Well, good evening, everyone. Oh, see, I like this. All right. <laughs> I am Dr. Natavia Curry, and I am the uh, president of the Lansing chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. This is Sandra Seaton. She's a member of the East Lansing chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. We are delighted to welcome our sorority sister here this evening to the campus of Michigan State University and to Mid-Michigan. And we just thank you so much for bringing such a joy to this space, enlightenment to this space, knowledge to this space, um, and being an example for not only us as your sorority sisters, but for all of us here who are very invested in seeing change happen and being a part of that change. So on behalf of our two chapters, we would like to come forward. Mm -hmm. On behalf of our two chapters, we would like to just um, provide you a little Alpha Kappa Alpha uh, swag, a little gift. <laughs> a little um, salmon pink and apple green to make it all good. So we just wanted to give you just a little something, but just thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Wonderful. I really thank loved every so minute much. of it. Thank, thank you so much. Can I just say really quickly that um, I love doing this work and sorors have come out to my events and I appreciate this because part of what led me down this path was that I wanted to see well, what was Alpha Kappa Alpha doing during the movement and I learned so much about our own history and our engagement with the, the movement and so it means a lot to have you all here to share in the moment with me. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. So I, um, you have seen the names of our sponsors scrolling throughout our slide presentation. Um, I want to thank all of our gracious sponsors. You all are um, incredible. I um, am overwhelmed this year by the um, new sponsors, the new ways that you all um, continue to partner with us. So um, thank you to our sponsors. I think I saw Terry Frazier. I want to thank um, Nikki and Terry Frazier at Sweet Encounters Bakery for providing tonight's treats. Now y'all don't run up these stairs and go get those. Um, <laughs> those pieces of cake. I also want to thank Uno Deuce Multimedia for live streaming and recording tonight's events. Y'all, I have an amazing, amazing team. I just very special thanks to my team. So Barbara Breedlove is here, um, our communications team, um, and to Renee Shepard, who couldn't be with us tonight. Thank you so much. I want to thank our volunteers, Jerrica Lee, Dr. Juanita Tooks, and OMS McGrath. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to thank our audience virtually and in person. Um, we're going to move across the hall. Um, up the stairs and across the hall for a reception. Please come grab some goodies, get your book signed um, by Dr. Ford, talk to Mila about the art collection. As we move out though, I just have one last favor. If you could let Dr. Ford and I get up these stairs, I don't know if y'all saw that our shoes are fabulous. But it's going to take us a minute. So if y'all would just stay seated so we can get up these stairs, and then the ushers will direct you out. Thank you all so much. Y'all have a good evening. <laughs>